In this video, I want to go through a few example problems of calculating free energy and using the free energy to determine whether a process will be spontaneous or not. So in the previous video, we established a link between spontaneity and the free energy, right? We used the second law of thermodynamics in order to determine that if the change in, in uh, a free energy is negative, right? So if you, if it decreases, then that's going to be a spontaneous process. Whereas an increase in free energy is going to be a related to a non-spontaneous process. So before we dig into some specific examples, I put together this chart in order to kind of guide you as far as the signs of delta S and delta H and how that's going to affect spontaneity or not, right? So um, so just all of this is related to our delta G equation, right? Our free energy equation. And based on the signs and the magnitude of the temperature, um, it's going to determine whether something would be spontaneous at all temperatures, non-spontaneous at all temperatures, or depending on the temperature. So let's take this first case here. So let's say we have a positive delta S, right? So this guy is positive. And the delta H is negative, right? So this delta H is negative. If this is the case, then the process will always be spontaneous. Why is that? Well, we know that there's these two, um, the, the delta H and the T delta S terms are subtracted, right? So there's this negative sign out front. If the entropy is positive, then this term is going to be negative. And obviously, if the enthalpy is negative, then this term is going to be negative. So delta G will always be negative. You could crank the temperature up as high as you want it to go. This won't change anything. It's going to be a negative delta G, right? So that's if you have a negative delta H and a positive delta S, then the process will be spontaneous at all temperatures. You'll always get a negative delta G. Okay. So now let's look at another example, another scenario, right? So let's say that for the second scenario, we have both of them being positive, right? So we got a positive uh, delta H, and I'll just put plus, and a positive delta S, right? So positive delta H, positive delta S. Well, in this case, the process will be spontaneous if the temperature is high enough, right? So basically what we're saying here is that we have a positive delta H, and if this delta S is also positive, that means that this negative, this term will be negative. But if the enthalpy is greater than this term, then you have a non-spontaneous process. But if the temperature is high enough, it'll shift the balance to where the magnitude of this term is greater. And so you'll end up with a negative delta G. So it'll be spontaneous only at high temperatures, right? Let's take another case, right? So we've, take, we've looked at the first two. The third one there is if they're bo uh, both negative. So you have a negative delta H and you also have a negative delta S. So if that's the case, then it's going to be spontaneous at low temperatures, right? Because since this delta S is negative now, right? That means this term is gonna be positive. So if, it's, uh, if the temperature is high enough, then you can get a positive result, a non-spontaneous uh, process. But if the temperature is low, then this term will have a greater magnitude. It will have a larger effect on this. So it would be a spontaneous process at a low enough temperature. Okay. And then the last case there is if we have a negative delta S and a positive delta H. If this is the case, then it's not going to be spontaneous at any temperature, right? Because you have a positive delta H and this term is also going to be positive. So regardless of the temperature is high or low, it's always going to be non-spontaneous at any temperature. So this, so this chart could help you um, just to be able to decipher whether processes are spontaneous or not. But keep in mind the exercise that we just went through. In order to figure this out, you just have to always go back to this equation and ask yourself, how does how do the signs of delta H and delta S affect the result that I'll get for delta G? OK, so let's look at some uh, some actual problems here. OK, so first problem here uh, gives you an, a reaction at uh, 298 Kelvin. It says that the values of delta H and delta S are 58 kilojoules and 176 joules per Kelvin, respectively. And it asks you two questions. The first, it says, what is the value of delta G at 298 Kelvin, right? Part B is asking you, assuming the enthalpy and entropy don't depend on temperature, 
at what temperature does delta G equal zero, right? And is, and is delta G going to be negative above or below this temperature? Okay, so we got quite a bit to do here. The first part should be pretty straightforward for us, right? All we have to do here is just use our delta G equation in order to solve for the, for the change in free energy, right? So all we have to do here is calculate delta G. Right, and we have the equation to do that, right? We know we just have delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Right, and it's giving you the temperature that this is occurring at. It's occurring at 298 Kelvin, right? Now, the only issue here is that you have an imbalance with your units. So your enthalpy is given to you in kilojoules, but your entropy is given to you in joules per Kelvin. So you're going to want to convert that. So let's do that off to the side here. So we want to convert delta S, right? Now you could do either. You could convert the enthalpy to make them compatible or convert the delta S. It doesn't matter. I'm going to convert delta S to kilojoules to make these units compatible. So delta S is negative 176. 0.6 joules per Kelvin. And so basically all I have to do is divide this by a thousand in order to get kilojoules. So that's going to give me negative 0 0.1766 kilojoules per Kelvin. All right, perfect. Now I can just plug in my delta S and solve for delta G. So let's do that. So delta G it's going to be equal to our delta H, which is negative 58.03 kilojoules minus the temperature, which is 298 Kelvin times our delta S converted to kilojoules, 0 0.1766 kilojoules per Kelvin, right? So when you do this, right, you'll multiply these two together, these Kelvin Kelvin's going to cancel out, right? So you're just left with kilojoules. So you can add those numbers together to get your final result. So delta G is going to be negative 5.55 kilojoules. So that gives us delta G for this reaction, negative 5.55 kilojoules. Now, since we got a negative delta G, this means that this uh, process is spontaneous. Right, negative delta G means this is a spontaneous process. Okay, cool. So we've calculated delta G. We know it's gonna be spontaneous at 298 Kelvin. Now the second part is asking us what temperature does delta G equal zero, right? So in order to do that, uh, we're gonna have to do a little bit of math here, a little bit of algebra. So that was part A. I'll put part B in a different color. So part B is asking us, okay, what temperature is delta G going to be equal to zero? So what we want to do is actually set this entire delta G expression equal to zero and then solve for the temperature, right? So in order to do that, uh, we're going to first set everything equal to zero. So we got delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. All of that is going to be zero, right? Since we're trying to figure out, okay, where at what temperature is delta G going to be equal to zero, right? So then doing some algebra here, you can isolate the temperature. So the temperature is going to be equal to delta H over delta S. So we have everything we need to plug in and solve, right? So if we do temperature is going to be equal to negative 58.03 kilojoules over negative 0 0.1766 kilojoules per Kelvin. Right, so that's going to give us a temperature of 328 Kelvin, right? So the temperature where delta G is going to be equal to zero is going to be 328 Kelvin. Okay, now the second part of this question is saying is delta G negative above or below this temperature? Basically asking us is the process spontaneous when we go above this temperature or when we go below this temperature, right? So in order to solve this, right, in order to think about this in a general sense, we have to think about our delta G equation, delta H minus T delta S, right? What we have here, we have a, um, a delta S that is negative, right? In this case, our delta S is negative and our delta H is also negative, 
right? So what that's going to mean for us is that at temperatures above 328, right? At temperatures above 328, this term is going to take over. It's going to be positive. So that means that we're going to have a non-spontaneous process above uh, to any temperature above 328 Kelvin. So a temperature above 328 Kelvin corresponds to a, uh, a positive delta G. And any temperature below 328 Kelvin results in a negative delta G, right? So this should be 328, right? So anything above 328 results in a positive delta G. Anything below 328 is a negative delta G, a spontaneous process, right? And we actually saw that in this first example, right? So we're at 298, that's below 328 Kelvin. That gave us a negative delta G, a spontaneous process, right? Okay, so that answers everything here for this question. So let's move on to the next one. So the next question says, given the following values of delta H and delta S, which of the following changes will be spontaneous at constant temperature and pressure? So um, I won't actually show the calculations for all of these, but basically all I'm doing here is plugging and solving. So you got delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. In each of these scenarios, you're given the temperature, you're given the entropy, you're given the enthalpy. The only thing you'll have to do, like we did in the previous question, is actually uh, convert from joules to kilojoules in each of these cases so that you'll get compatible units. But let's go through each one. So for A, get a delta G. Once you plug everything in, you get a delta G of positive 23.5 kilojoules. And so that means that since this uh, delta G is positive, this is going to be a non-spontaneous process, right? So we get a non-spontaneous process there. For part B, if you plug everything in, delta G is going to be equal to negative five kilojoules. So since it's negative, that's going to be a spontaneous process. For C, if you plug those numbers in, you get delta G is equal to negative 11.49 kilojoules. So again, that would be a spontaneous process. And actually for part C, we didn't even have to do the calculation because we know anytime the delta S is positive and delta H is negative, that means it's gonna be spontaneous regardless because you'll have a net, both terms will be negative and then so you'll end up with a negative delta G regardless. So this would actually be spontaneous at any temperature. And for part D, plug in everything, you get delta G is equal to negative two kilojoules. And so again, that's going to be spontaneous. Okay, cool. So uh, hopefully these two examples were illuminating to show how to calculate delta G um, and how to use that delta G value that you calculate in order to determine whether a process is going to be spontaneous or non-spontaneous.